Welcome to this message by Ray Steadman titled, The Ambitious Heart, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Mark 10, 32 through 52. Recorded in the Gospels, uh, took place. And as we read this account today, we'll see how clearly the Lord Jesus foresaw the cross and all that it would involve. And... Uh, how resolute is his determination to go ahead and face what was coming. We'll also see how blind and foolish the disciples are, how uh, stupidly they act, even in the face of revelation that's given to them. And uh, then how Mark illustrates all this with an incident that happened as Jesus leaves the city of Jericho. Let's begin with the passage that... Uh, that finds them on the road going up to Jerusalem. 10th chapter, the 32nd verse. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to them, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Now, this is the third time that we've seen Jesus make this special announcement to his disciples in which he informed them in increasing detail of what the cross would involve as they came into Jerusalem. And each time, you notice, he includes the promise of the resurrection, which they never seem to hear. But Mark particularly indicates that this is a, a very tense atmosphere as they're going along the road. He says, Jesus went first all alone, no one accompanying him. And then behind him comes the band of the disciples, the 12 disciples. And Mark says, they were astonished, literally amazed. And then behind them came the crowd that was following, the multitude, waiting upon the teaching of Jesus. And they were afraid, Mark says. All of which indicates that there was a strange sense of impending doom. There was a sense of an approaching crisis with sinister possibilities. And these disciples are very much aware of that. And even the crowd feels the tension. Now, what made the crowd afraid and the disciples amazed was unquestionably the attitude of Jesus. One of the other Gospels says that at this point, he set his face like a flint to go up to Jerusalem. There was a resolute determination here on his part to go. He was ad adamant. He could not be changed. And though he was going into danger, and he knew it, and the disciples knew it, and the crowd sensed it, there was this strange, determinate resolve on Jesus' part to go forward, and he went all alone toward this. And so it's a tense atmosphere as they travel on here. The second thing about this account that Mark brings before us is the announcement that Jesus makes. And you'll notice again how filled with detail it is. He knows what he's heading into. He doesn't quite know the timing of it, but this would unfold, he knew, as he went on. But he knew that he was going to be delivered by the priests and the scribes, that it would, he would end up in the hands of the Romans. He would be condemned to death. And he adds three details here that has not been included in any announcement before. They will mock him, and spit upon him, and scourge him. Now, how did Jesus know that? I think the answer is that he learned it from the Scriptures. Every one of these events, every one of these incidents are predicted in the prophets. And in fact, Luke tells us that in, at this very point, Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all that the prophets have, have predicted concerning me will be fulfilled. Our Lord was not given some kind of insight 
particularly, he learned it by studying Isaiah and Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and Psalm 22, these other Old Testament scriptures that clearly predicted these events. And so he announces to his disciples that he's going up to this uh, to meet these things. Now, he's on his way to, the, to Jerusalem and to the cross. But the disciples, Mark goes on to reveal, uh, see something else awaiting them. They're looking at the pathway to glory because we read now that in verse 35 that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. If anybody ever comes to you that way, watch out. <laughs> whatever you... We ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now Matthew tells us that the mother of James and John came with them, and they had talked her into making this presentation. Mark goes back of the mother to the, to the two disciples, tells us that it was their idea. And so... Jesus knew that the request had come from them, and so he answers them. Now, I want you to notice a bit what it is they're asking for, because many have misunderstood this story and felt that these disciples were asking for the wrong thing. But they weren't. They were asking for really something that Jesus had given them every reason to ask for just a few days before. Uh, Luke, I think it is, records that just before this, they had been promised by Jesus that they would sit on thrones, 12 thrones, when he came into his glory and judge the 12 tribes of Israel with him. And that's what they have in their mind as they're walking up to Jerusalem. There are thrones waiting for them. And so they ask for three specific things. They ask for preeminence. They want to sit on those thrones. They want to have the, the honor and exaltation that a throne represents. But they had been promised that. And second, they want proximity. Once the disciples knew that there were thrones waiting for them, the twelve, as uh, they had in the twice now in this account fallen into a discussion as to which one would be the greatest, you can understand why they would begin to dis discover or to discuss where these thrones would be placed in relationship to Jesus. And James and John, evidently, talking this over with their mother, decided that there was no good reason why they couldn't have the inside circle. One on the right hand and one on the left. And so they come with this request. They want to be near to Jesus. Now, is that wrong? No, it's not wrong to want to be near to Jesus, is it? They were going to sit with him, and they thought it would be perfectly in order to ask to be given the positions nearest to him. And, of course, they wanted power, because that's what a throne represented. And in some sense, they had already experienced the gift of power from Jesus. They had been sent out and given power to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. And so they were asking for what had been promised, and nothing wrong with what they asked. And so when our Lord replies to them, he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't say, what's the matter with you, fella? How can you be so proud? He doesn't rebuke this ambition to be near him, to have preeminence, and to have power. But he does say to them, in effect, as we'll see, that they're going about it entirely the wrong way. That brings us to his answer. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. 
but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now, what is he saying? Well, he's saying, the trouble with you fellows is, you're not, it's not that you're not asking for the right thing, you are, but you're asking for it with no understanding of what's involved. You're ignorant first. You know not what you're asking. And then he goes on to tell us what it is they're ignorant of. They're ignorant of the cost of this, the price that it would demand. And he implies that he himself is on the same path as they wanted to follow. He's on his way to glory, but he's ready to pay the price. Are you able, he says, to drink of the cup that I have to drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am going to be baptized with? Now there he employs two beautiful figures to help us to understand what he was facing, the cup and the baptism. What does a cup mean? I'm sure there isn't one of us that hasn't quoted 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over with joy. And what do we mean when we say that? It's even been made into a popular song today, and you can hear it on the radio, my cup runs over with joy and with love and other things. Well, there I think it's clear that the cup is the realm of your experience the circumstances into which you've been placed. They're joyful. They're happy. They produce a happy reaction on your part. That which life has handed to you is given in the figure of a cup, and you find it joyful. Now, in the Old Testament, this is also used about things that aren't so joyful. Jeremiah speaks of Israel as having to drink the cup of the fury of the Lord at his hand. And here it again, it's something handed to Israel that they had to drink. So a cup is a figure of, of what life hands to you that you have no choice of. Either it produces good or bad reaction, but it's something that's given to you. A cup is given, and you must drink it. And our Lord, of course, is speaking of the cross. He saw it as that kind of a thing, a cup that was given to him by his father. Later in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember, he'll pray, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so he's speaking of that whole incident involving the suffering, the anguish, the pain, the rejection, the mocking, the scourging, the spitting, and all of the cross. This, he says, is the Father's choice. For him, it's handed to him to drink. And when he uses the figure of baptism, what does he mean? Well, again, this is a figure that's very common in the scriptures, both in the Old and the New Testament. The word means to dip, to just dip somebody into water or some other liquid, immerse them in it. And it's used about uh, Israelites as they left Egypt. They were baptized unto Moses. In the Red Sea, we're told. That is, as they passed through the waters of the Red Sea and the way that was opened up to them, they were surrounded by the waters and baptized by them. In that sense, they were overwhelmed by the waters. And this, then, is a figure of some event which is given to the Lord, which would totally affect him. It would overwhelm him. He'd be immersed in it. He would be so placed in it that uh, it would touch and affect everything about him. That's a baptism. And that, he says, is what is waiting for him. The cross would, would seek him out at every level of his life, would touch him and immerse him and overwhelm him. And you remember how beautifully descriptive you have it in some of the Psalms. He says, all thy waves and thy billows have gone over me. He's just completely caught up and saturated with these terrible things. Now he says to James and John, that's the price of glory. That's the price. Are you able to drink of that? And look at the self-confidence now that they exude. They sound like Muhammad Ali just before a fight. 
sure, Lord, whatever. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference. So bring it on. We're able. And you notice how Jesus replies. He doesn't try to explain it all to them. He leaves that to later events and the hand of the Father to unfold it to them. But he says, he takes them at their word. He says, all right, I'll grant you what you ask. You want to be, you want to drink of my cup and drink it and be baptized with my baptism? You shall. Now, these disciples didn't know what they were asking for, and sometimes neither do we when we ask of God, but God sometimes grants it anyway. If they had known what it meant, they would never have asked for it, I'm sure. I remember Dr. A.B. Bruce writing in this connection. He says, if crosses would leave us alone, we would leave them alone too. But they don't. They're handed to us. They're a cup given to us. And uh, these disciples could not escape it. What it meant, of course, was that they too would suffer like Jesus. They too would have to bear reproach and shame and anguish and suffering and death. And as it turned out, that's what happened. James was the very first of the apostles to die, recorded in the 22nd chapter of Acts. How Herod took him and, and beheaded him, murdered him. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. And John was the last, way at the other end. And these two brothers form a kind of parenthesis of martyrdom within which all the apostles, as their turn came, were finally put to death for the sake of Jesus. We're not told exactly how John died, though some have suggested in the early church fathers that he was boiled in oil. Others say that he died a natural death, and it's a little uncertain, but we do know that he was exiled to the island of Patmos for the testimony of Jesus, and he underwent much of suffering and shame and, and, uh, and, and punishment for the Lord's sake. And so Jesus granted them that request. But then he went on to explain that he couldn't grant what they'd ask. It's not mine to give, he says, this this position of sitting one at my right hand and one at my left. But it will be given. Somebody's going to sit there. That's true. But it's the Father who determines who it will be. And he gives a very suggestive thing here. It's very illuminating, if you think about it, the way he puts it. He doesn't say, as we might expect, uh, it will be, it is for those who are prepared for it. That's what we might expect him to say. But he says, it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And if you think carefully of those words, you can see that he's implying that the Father chooses men for this honor. He prepares the man for that place by the circumstances, by the cups and the baptisms that he must put him through. And then he prepares the honor for the man. You notice that? God always starts with people. He doesn't start with events. His goal is the shaping and molding of lives. That's where he begins. And he fits the events to that end. And so, somebody's going to sit at the right hand of the Father, the right hand of Jesus, left hand of Jesus, but God is going to mold that person and prepare them for it and then prepare that height of glory for them as well. Well, now, at this point, uh, he turns to the ten. And we read, When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to him, You know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now we've already seen that as they're going up the road to Jerusalem, Jesus sees the cross waiting for him. James and John see thrones waiting for them. 
And what do the other ten see? They see James and John. <laughs> They're angry. They're upset at him. Why? Because they got there first. Obviously, they want the same things that James and John want. And they're only mad because James and John beat them to it. And that's often the explanation for our anger, isn't it? We're so upset because somebody thought of it before we did. And they got to him first. Now, you notice how Jesus sets aside all this business of politicking and maneuvering and asking for favors and granting special privileges and all that. That's the way the world works. That's uh, not to be part of the kingdom of God. In the kingdom, in the church, if you like, there's not to be struggling and striving for position and honor and all this. Paul brings this out so beautifully in his development of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12. Remember, and he says that because we have gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit, and a ministry opened to us by the Lord Jesus, and power granted to us by the Heavenly Father. We don't need to be in competition with anybody. Each one has his own ministry, and nobody's the rival of the other. And you don't need to envy one another. He says, the eye cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. You don't need to despise somebody and look down on him. Nor, he says, can the hands say, because I am not an eye, I'm not part of the body. Because they're all members that are necessary to the body of Christ. And so all co competition is removed from the church by these terms. And that's what he, our Lord wants to set before these disciples. So he gathers them together patiently. My, how patient he was. Sets before them again. He says, now, fellas, sit down. I want to say something to you. He says, you've looked at the Gentiles, that is the non-believers around, and have you noticed that when they exercise authority, it's always over somebody. They measure their power by how many are under them. And that's the mark of authority. Now, I don't think that he means to... to uh, say that that must be eliminated, that we have to attack that sort of thing. He's simply recognizing it as being there. And that's the way people do think. It's still true today. You, uh, we judge success by how many people are under me, or how many I am over. And this is the measure of it. And although it produces all kinds of rivalry and competition, and skulldudgery, and politicking, and conniving, and maneuvering, and manipulating, and trying to undercut somebody. It produces all that. Nevertheless, it, you, you can't blame people for that because that's all they know. They don't know any other basis for achieving authority or power. But now notice what Jesus is doing. It's very radical. The key thing here is these words. But it shall not be so among you. The church is not to be that way. It's not to be set up as a hierarchy of power. There's no chain of command in the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus had already said to these disciples, One is your master, and all you are brethren. And every apostle is careful to remind us of the danger of lording it over the brethren, of those in positions of authority thinking they have the right to tell somebody what to, what to do or what to act or how to act or what to think or how to behave. And somebody has the right to make decisions that others have to follow. That's not true in the church. Paul is careful to say, to the Corinthians, we're not lords over your faith. You can do what you want. You stand before God responsible to him, not to me. But he's also faithful to point out what it is that they need to do and to warn them of the results that may follow if they don't want to do that. 
but nobody's ever commanded by another brother in the church to do something. Only the Lord commands. And I, I think we need to think this through in great detail. The church has always opposed prelacy, that is, papacy, the idea of a pope, uh, a head over all the church, a human head over the, all the church. But unfortunately, among Protestant and evangelical churches, what we have done is rejected the idea of one pope over all the churches and made one pope in every church. <laughs> and surely that's just as bad or worse. No, there's no authority to being a pastor. Just a brother who has given certain gifts in order to be able to help under people understand what they're doing and where they're going. But I have no authority over you, nor you over me. We, both, we all are brethren before the Lord. And this is what our Lord makes clear. It shall not be so among you. And the church must not reflect the position and the practices of the world in this regard. Now he goes on to give us the key. What is it then that makes true authority? And here it is. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. Now he said that before. And we've commented on this before. But here again, it's underscored for us that authority, true authority, arises out of servitude, meeting somebody else's need. Isn't that what a servant does? You know, the, the world is full of servitude. We're always serving each other in one way or another and being served by others. You go to a, a hotel and check in, and somebody picks up your bags and carries them in. It's a first-rate hotel. <laughs> of course, you tip them 50 cents a bag, but they've served you. The maid comes in and makes up your room, makes your bed for you in the morning cleans up the bathroom and puts new soap in the dishes and towels on the rack, and she's serving you. And uh, you're paying for it, I know, but it still is servitude. And there's many ways. We serve one another at home and in various places. And what is the character of it? It's always meeting another person's need. Now, that's the key to service. And when Jesus says, when you are willing to give yourself to meet another person's need, something remarkable happens. Without you even wanting it, you establish a strange authority in that person's life. They want a response. Their attitude towards you changes. They want to do something in return. They don't have to. They want to. It makes them want to uh, respond in kind in some way. And this is, he said, is the, is the difference of principle in the kingdom of God, that this is the way authority arises. And those who have authority are those that people have learned to respect and to honor because they've been served by them in one way or another. Their needs have been met by them. And that's where authority lies within the church. And of course, the great example is what Jesus says. So or for the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the ultimate picture of the servant. The one who had every right to authority becomes the one who gives up everything to meet our need. That's the mark of how to function in the kingdom of God. We sang it this morning, Man of Sorrow, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. There's a strange fallacy abroad today that Jesus died, we're told, in order that we who believe in him might never have to face any kind of death. Now, that's not true. That's not what the scriptures say or imply in any way. From that comes the idea that when you become a Christian, everything ought to smooth out for you and everything ought to get nice for you. And uh, you should have no trouble in your life because Jesus bore it all and you don't have to bear anything. No, 
The scriptural position is Jesus died in order that he might go with us through death and bring us out onto the other side. He doesn't eliminate the death at all. It's there. But he goes with us through it and brings us out, that's the point, into resurrection. That's why he died, to give his life a ransom for many. Now at this point, there occurs a very remarkable thing. Suddenly, Mark changes the subject. It looks almost abruptly. And he begins to speak of an incident that took place as they were leaving the city of Jericho. And there's no apparent connection, at first glance at least, with, with what we've just been looking at. But uh, Mark tells us about this blind man whose eyes were open. Verse uh, 46, they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great multitude, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, rise, he is calling you. And throwing off his mantle, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. Now, it looks at first glance, as I said, as though there's no connection there. Suddenly it changes the subject. Was it just by chance that as Jesus left Jericho, a blind man named Bartimaeus was sitting by the side of the road? Well, it can be read that way, as though all that Mark is doing is just giving a chronicle of what happened, and this was just one of the chance events that occurred as they left. But do things happen that way? Or was it perhaps the prearrangement of an infinitely wise father, a sovereign God, who arranged to have a blind man named Bartimaeus there because it tied in directly with what Jesus had been saying? and that it illustrated exactly something more he wanted the disciples to know. Well, let me show you some rather interesting ties in this little account. First of all, you'll notice there is an unusual repetition in giving the name of this man. We're told that he was Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, sitting by the roadside. Now, uh, Bartimaeus means, the name Bartimaeus means the son of Timaeus. So it's really a, uh, a repetition here to say again, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, because they mean the same thing. And in a sense, therefore, this name is being underscored for us like no other name in Scripture here. It's, it's translated for us, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. There must be something about it that Mark wants us to notice. And when you look at the Greek word for a translation for Timaeus, you, you discover why. The word means honor. And this beggar was named the son of honor. Now what was it that James and John came asking Jesus for? Honor, was it? that we may sit at the right hand and your left hand when you come into your glory. We want honor. And here was a blind man named the Son of Honor who sat by the side of the road. Notice, too, that Mark skips over here some events. He, uh, he seems to uh, eliminate some of the things that happened in Jericho, and he goes from the word they were coming into a Jericho, and then he skips over the story of Zac Zacchaeus, and uh, all that happened in connection with this little short man who, who uh, Jesus met and went to lunch with and all. And he 
goes immediately to the time when they left the city to again emphasize that there's a, there's a tie here with these events. Furthermore, you'll notice that when the blind man came to Jesus, Jesus said to him in verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? And when James and John came to Jesus with their request for honor, in verse 36, he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Exactly the same words, isn't it? What was the trouble with these disciples? Why, they were blind, weren't they? They couldn't see what was involved. They wanted something, but they didn't see anything connected with it. They couldn't see the hurt, the cross, the cup, the baptism. They came asking for it, but they, they were blind. What was the matter with Bartimaeus? He was blind. And when he came, Jesus asked them both the same question, what do you want me to do? Now, uh, the point, of course, of the story, and the reason why I think Mark is given it here is in the impressive thing about this account is what Bartimaeus did. Here's this man who's conscious of his blindness, which the disciples were not. And yet, and when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, he became tremendously excited and he began to demand his attention. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody began to say, shh, shh quiet. We're trying to hear what he said. And Bartimaeus said, Paid no attention. He says, Jesus, son of David, stop. Have mercy on me. And they, they shushed him again. Many big, uh, uh, commanded him to be silent, it said. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't be put off. And finally he yelled out and cried out so that he got Jesus' attention. And when our Lord stopped to serve this man, to meet his need, he said to him, he called him to him, and he said to him, what do you want me to do? Now, isn't that a silly question to ask a blind man when you have the power and he knows you have to restore his sight? But Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? And Bartimaeus put it so simply, Lord, I want to see. Give me back my sight. And immediately Jesus said to him, it's done. Your faith has made you well. Bartimaeus saw for the first time in his life. Now, why do you think Mark has put this account here? That here, the son of honor is enabled to see. Well, I think he's saying something to his disciples, don't you? And to us. He's saying that when we come asking for good things from God, also ask to be able to see what it involves. Ask to have your sight given to you so you see yourself and all that may be needed before God can answer that prayer. That's what he's saying. I remember a couple of New Year's Eves ago when we had a watch night service here. I was standing here on this platform. There were about as many in the auditorium that night as there are today. And I, the room was in darkness. And I was standing here with just a candle, a large white candle in my hand. And uh, that was the only light in the room. And I remember I was talking about the verse in Proverbs that says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching the uh, hidden things of the heart. And I remember how there came flooding upon me a consciousness of my own life as I stood there. And I re remarked upon the fact that when I was just a young Christian, I felt that uh, God only had a few minor things to change about me, and I would be pretty, pretty well perfect. <laughs> I knew there were some things that needed to be changed. I could see it. But they weren't too serious. And once those were changed, there wouldn't be a lot left that God had to work with. That was many years ago. But the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching the heart. In the hands of the Holy Spirit, my human spirit was used of God to begin to unfold to me gradually through the years 
all the many areas in which there were deeper involvements in evil than I ever dreamed. And I remember how through the years there came painful experiences, cups and baptisms that I had to go through that opened my eyes till I began to see with increasing clarity how much of my life had been possessed with the spirit of selfishness, how I had injured others and hurt those close to me, and how how much I was in the grip of evil forces in my life that controlled me and devastated me. And yet how every time there came a new revelation of the depth of my own vileness, there also came a revelation of the cleansing power of God. So that through the course of the years, now many, many years, I discovered that as my self-esteem began to sink lower and lower, my sense of self-worth began to rise higher and higher. And I understood that I only had, I only had value as God possessed and cleansed my life. That's why I could sing as so many of us have sung uh, about Saving Grace, that song we often sing, that thanks God for having saved such a wretch as I. And I began to pray increasingly as the years went on. That prayer that David records in the 139th Psalm, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And I think that's what God wants us all to pray. That's what he wanted his disciples to pray. How blind they were. How foolish and ignorant and self-confident they were, not knowing what was in them and what God would have to do to re remove it. And I'd like to have you join with me now in that prayer. Let's just bow together and I'll lead us in praying that prayer. Father, we ask it of you. Search us, O God, and try us. Know our thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in us, Lord. Show it to us, that we might see how much we stand in need of the cleansing of grace and the forgiveness of your mercy. Lead us in the way everlasting. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so so good With every breath that I am able Oh I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire and in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God. Hey! Cause all my life you have been faithful. Oh, yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. Goodness of God. Your 
Your 